Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual series that we've been co-sponsoring with um, Book Yaya and the Greenberg Library. My name is Joan Kunin. I'm the program coordinator at the Chappaqua Library. And joining me today is John Sexton. And I'm not sure if, if Janet's going to be here, but they're both from the um, Greenberg Library. We're not far apart from each other. And uh, together with as Book Yaya, with Book Yaya, we have a plan this program. And I just want to say as an aside that the Chappaqua Library and in fact all the Westchester libraries are indebted to Book Yaya for the wonderful slate of programs they have supplied to us over this last year, especially during this time of COVID. They've been invaluable in giving us these wonderful programs and we all appreciate it. And uh, not only do the libraries appreciate it, but the library community throughout Westchester County. So thank you so much, Delaunay. And I wanna make a personal thank you to Delaunay. It has been my pleasure mm -hmm. to work with you and Dan Freed. Um, you've been just thorough and professional and, and really terrific to work with. I can't say enough adjectives. So thank you all. So now I will turn it over to you and um, I will go into a logo so you don't see me anymore. <laughs> but thank you all and welcome everybody to this program. I'm sure it will be everything you hope for it to be. So again, thank you all. Well, that was incredibly kind of you. And now my eyes are tearing up from that uh, really, really kind words. Thank you. I, this has been something that has gotten my husband, Dan, and I through um, this difficult time with COVID. So it's meant everything to be able to partner with libraries to celebrate what we feel is one of the most important parts of life, which is stories and writers and sharing those stories and having community. Um, and again, I can't think of a better place for that to happen with a library and to celebrate that. And I'm eternally grateful for the wonderful writers who have been part of the series, very much Caitlin Greenidge, whom I've adored since her first novel, which she very kindly came to Spoken English to celebrate. And one of the joys of doing these events is getting to meet new fabulous writers such as Shruti Swami this evening. So I'm thrilled these two incredible women are together. So with that, I'm gonna introduce these incredible women who are here to celebrate Caitlin's new novel, Liberty. Shruti Swami is the winner of two O. Henry Awards. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, the Kenyan Review Online, Prairie Schrooner, and elsewhere. In 2012, she was Vassar College's 50th W.K. Rose Fellow and has been awarded residencies at the Malay Colony for the Arts, Blue Mountain Center, and Hedgebrook. She is a Kundaman Fiction Fellow, a 2017-2018 Steinbeck Fellow at San Jose University, and a recipient of a 2018 grant from the Elizabeth George Foundation. Her book, A House as a Body, was shortlisted for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for debut short story collection, and her novel, The Archer, is forthcoming. Caitlin Greenidge, debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Friedman, was one of the New York Times Critics' top 10 books of 2016. Her writing has appeared in Vogue, Glamour, The Wall Street Journal, Elle, BuzzFeed, Transition Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Believer, American Short Fiction, and other places. She is a recipient of fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She is currently Features Director at Harper's Bazaar, as well as a contributing writer for the New York Times. Her second novel, Liberty, is published by Algonquin Books. And now, please help me welcome Caitlin, who is going to read from her novel for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just, I had such a wonderful time when I last met with you um, and I'm sad that we can't do this in person, but I'm glad that we can do a virtual event. Um, so I'm gonna read from the, it's about maybe like a quarter of the way through the book. So um, Liberty is based on the life of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was the first black female doctor in New York state. Um, her daughter married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti moved to Haiti, her marriage fell apart and sort of appealed to her mother to come and get her. And um, and to do so um, would have really gone against the, the tide of the time, um, sort of at the turn of the century. Um, but her mother did and, and brought her back to the US and for the rest of her life, um, her daughter sort of longed for 
her life in Haiti that she loved very much, but also for the rest of her life, she got these letters from her from her former in-laws sort of saying, come back here um, by breaking up this marriage. You have um, not only made us very sad, but you are messing with this whole project of um, Black freedom and Black nationhood that we're doing in Haiti. Um, so when I heard that story, I heard it from one of the descendants of um, the doctor and her daughter, who's named Ellen Holly. Um, and uh, I was doing oral history with her. She told me that story. I was really taken with it. I really wanted to write a novel about it. This novel takes those details and sort of um, uh, switches them around a little bit because it is fiction. So this novel um, takes place during Reconstruction era US and, and Reconstruction era Haiti. And the section I'm gonna read is um, a, a piece that takes place just after the draft riots in New York City. So this is a little bit before reconstruction. Um, the draft riots took place in 1863 during the Civil War um, when uh, white mobs attacked uh, black Manhattanites and um, white people who were considered to be sympathizers to them. Uh, they burnt down an orphanage dedicated to black children um, and churches and destroyed uh, um, a lot of black settlements in Manhattan. And so many people um, attempted to escape over the water to Brooklyn. Um, and so this is a sort of imagined of the aftermath of that for Liberty, the main character, and her mother, um, uh, Dr. Sampson, who's based on this woman, um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart. So I'm gonna read here. It was hard planning, oftentimes hours of talking with no clear answers. But when the women got going, the whole room began to vibrate. Sometimes it seemed that the white walls themselves flushed when the women raised their voices. How strange it was to sit around um, we sit around them at their feet or in the corner and hear them shout, these same women who all week long told me and the other colored girls in town to speak softly, to keep our heads down and our backs straight, to train our eyes to overlook the insults the world outside of town heaped at our feet. Those women told girls like me to ignore the present day horrors around us, to look only toward the future, toward another place that did not exist yet. But here in the room, I could imagine that I was already there. The women would begin the meeting sitting upright, but by the end, they would be sprawled, leaning against seats, arms crossed over stools, sipping water, laughing, shouting back and forth. You knew a meeting was getting work done when Miss Dinah began her sharp, piercing giggle. It was uncontrollable, a little hysterical, and did not necessarily prompt the other women to join in. It was more like the whistle of a tea kettle. It told you pressure was high, water was rolling to a boil, that something was happening and that whatever it was, it was as wondrous and yet as deceptively common as water transforming into air. I have never in my life felt anything as powerful as whatever force was in that room while those women talked. And I began to believe that it was the talking itself that did it, that perhaps women's voices and harmony were like some sort of Flintstone sparking or like the hot burst of air that comes through a window billowing the curtains before rain. Sometimes I imagine the whole room lifting up for their, from their talk, lifting up and spinning out, out into the future times to come when everyone would be truly free the time I thought we were all planning for. To bring them back down when a workday was done, they would turn to some sort of amusement. It had to be something calming, something sober. We need to rest a little in order to keep going, was what Miss Annie always said. They decided on trading compliments. They'd write them down on slips of paper, unsigned, but addressed to the lady they wished to compliment, and then put them in an old flower tin Mama had. At the end of the meeting, they'd draw the slips out one at a time and read the ode, and then the fun began in guessing the author. Everyone saved their praise by pasting the compliments into little books they stitched together and then passing them around to be signed by every lady present, a record of attendance. They made bindings out of, out of the rags they had around stuffed into the bottom of their sewing baskets. Friendship albums, they called them. Everybody's album started neat and clean and pretty, of course, but it was every woman's goal to have a ruined one, a book with warm pages and extra leaves stuffed in one, it stuffed in one bursting at the seams because that showed how loved you were. Mama was jealous of the other women. Sometimes at the end of a meeting, I caught her fingering the pages of her own album, looking from hers to theirs. Hers was always a bit neater, a bit cleaner and much thinner, even after all she'd done for the orphans, even as the group conspired about how to make her a hospital, even after all that work, 
Mama would lift the other women's heavier books and sign them smiling, but only a few of them signed hers. I suppose I should have been angry at the other women on behalf of Mama. If I was a loyal daughter, I would have felt that, but at the end of every meeting, I looked at Mama's thin book and only felt sorry for her, not mad at them. I did not know what to do with a vanquished mama. I saw her hurt, but I still thought she could overcome it. She never spoke of it, so to me, it was another thing to add to the load she carried. Everyone has their own burden liberty, she was fond of telling me whenever I complained about my inability to do arithmetic or when another girl was mean or petty. So I thought she could solve this setback, that it was temporary, that it was something mama could fix with her cleverness. Once in her office, I found the discards of her attempts at praise for the other women written on the backs of notes to the pharmacist and on the discarded labels of old medicine bottles. You've done fine work and I look forward to your work improving even more. Although at first I was not sure, I see you now are a true Christian woman. It was as if she could not, in spite of herself, break her reserve and warmly compliment any of these women who discarded her from their care. You see, I am not very talented at this. I started, Mama was standing beside me, watching me read her weak words. I think it was the first time she admitted a failing to me. I felt a little flush of embarrassment for her. Liberty, she said, write something for me, kind but not too kind, nothing that would inspire envy. You cannot do it? I do not have a way with words like you do. She sighed. Then she said very quietly, the only good poem I've ever written is you. A daughter is a poem. A daughter is a kind of psalm. You in the world responding to me is a song I made. I cannot make another. My heart filled but quickly sank because what freeborn thing can bear to be loved as much as that? The least I could do was write a poem for her. I'll stop there. That was so beautiful. Um, we have a question from the audience. So we're gonna start with that and then I'll bring Shruti in because um, it's a beautiful question to kick off this, uh, the beautiful reading that you read from your book. Um, from Carol Gladstone, Caitlin, how did someone so young make such perceptive insights into a woman's coming of age story and discovering her passions and what liberty really means? Oh, um, well, thank you for the perceptive insights comment. I'm not that young, so, <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh, but I think I I thought a lot um, when I was writing the book, the sort of twin themes that I thought a lot about were motherhood and freedom. And I tried to read as much as I could about how other writers before me, other fiction writers in particular, have thought about that. Um, and sort of the driving force of this book was a quote from a a Toni Morrison essay, uh, interview um, from the 80s, um, where she sort of says, in a, as an aside, motherhood is a form of freedom. She's, she was talking about it in a very specific context. She was talking about it in terms of um, Black women, in terms of the history of Black women in this country of not being allowed uh, really any sort of form of self-determination by the larger state or the larger culture outside of oneself. And that in, in raising your children, there's a certain um, sense of freedom in that you get to determine this person's life and make choices for them um, in a way that the larger world doesn't really allow you to do for yourself. And it was such an interesting way to approach motherhood. And of course, when you read that quote in that in that um, interview from the 80s, you, to me at least, I think immediately of you know Morrison overturning sort of that idea over and over when she would write Beloved. Um, but I wanted to explore sort of what um, motherhood looks like in, in a state of supposed freedom, knowing that um, freedom in the United States is a, is a word that is used throughout our culture, but means very different things to different people. Um, and that it's conditional, that um, freedoms that some people have at the top of society are not granted to people who are at the bottom at all um, and are, are in fact usually seen as threats. Um, and that how you experience and what you imagine freedom is is entirely based on, on um, your position in the world. Um, and, and yet we have this word that um, we invoke so often in our culture and very rarely define when we're having conversations, we just sort of say the word freedom and expect everybody is thinking about the same thing or, or has the same level of access to it. Um, so I really wanted to explore those two things in the book and 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 um, that was what sort of um, kicked off a, a lot of the um, 
the writing within it. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, what a great way to start off the discussion. I'm going to bring in Shruti for her to kick that off. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for that beautiful reading and for this beautiful book. I just enjoyed spending time with it. It was such a pleasure thinking of questions to ask you because um, this book is so rich in so many ideas and details um, and, uh, and it, you built such an immersive world. Um, Maybe what one question I had to start off was um, when I heard what like the real life counterpart about the real life counterparts of Dr. Samson and Liberty. Um, I was thinking like, you know, you would think that the Dr. Samson character is the historical one, like is the person who she's so trailblazing and she's like really made a mark on history. So, but your novelist eye went to Liberty's counterpart, the daughter. And so I was curious about centering um, somebody who still, you know, did make a mark on history and had a very interesting life, but was not like the necessarily the obvious choice for a protagonist in this, in this story. Yeah, the choice sort of came from two places. Um, one of them was, um, you know, I worked as an oral history oral historian for a number of years at a Black History Museum in Brooklyn called the Weeksville Heritage Center, which is where um, Weeksville is the free Black community where um, the historical comp counterpart of Dr. Sampson, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart grew up. Um, so it's a free Black community that was founded pre-Civil War um, in central Brooklyn. Um, and one of my jobs there was that I was um, working on the oral history project. And so um, we interviewed people who were connected with the community, um, descendants of people who originally founded it, and then also people who had lived there um, during the Great Migration. Um, and so I did a lot of these interviews with older Black people, oftentimes um, sort of in the interview, if, if it would come up, they would tell, talk about how they were the first Black person to do something, either you know be in their class at a certain elementary school or um, to work at a certain job or to move into a certain part of the neighborhood. Um, and to a person, those parts of the interview were always very, um, uh, very curated. There were, you know, there was a wall up, and and when you asked about what that experience felt emotionally, many people did not actually want to go there. And these were people who, um, you know, if I asked them about their childhood or or sort of like other parts, they were they were willing to be open, but that wall was there about not wanting really to go there to explain what that felt like, and so. When I was writing the, when I was thinking about sort of who was going to tell the story, I was like, well, it could come from the point of view of the doctor. But um, one of the things I wanted to explore in the book was sort of the emotional toll that comes from being an accept, from pointing yourself to be an exception, especially a racial exception. And so if she is an exception, um, that character is not going to be the type of person who really divulges the um, sort of actual emotional toll. Like, like part of being an exception is is building that emotional wall to be able to do it, to be able to to be the one in those spaces where you're not welcome. You have to really keep that emotional wall up. And it, and um, I know very few people who have had those experiences who can take that wall down when they come home. And so that's part of what I wanted to explore as well. So it made sense to have the the novel. Um, written from the point of view of this woman's daughter who's able to see that emotional wall, to feel the toll of it, and, and to have questions about whether or not um, her mother being an exception is worth that uh, emotional fracture. Um, and then the other thing was that as I was writing it, I was sort of thinking more and more about um, particularly, you know, I worked for about 10 years um, in Black history sites, and I was so struck by how often people um, of all races, I think both white visitors and black visitors and and non black and non white visitors to the site assumed that um, black history was made up of the moments when black people encountered whiteness. And they really resisted any time that um, when when our historical interpretations talked about black communities about internal struggles about sort of like internal stuff happening the interest was always in like who was the first to do something in a white space or or when did white violence encroach on this space and the idea that um there's a story in black people living freely talking amongst each other not encountering racialized violence it was really hard for people to understand that's history too like that's that's important to talk about um there's value there um and that and also that it existed in the past and it can exist today um and so i was thinking about that and so i was like you know i i, I want to sort of set myself the artistic problem of setting a novel during the civil war with um 
two black women protagonists and uh, whiteness is gonna be on the periphery, periphery, white characters is gonna be on the periphery, white violence is gonna be on the periphery, um, but I want this to read authentic to a reader. Um, and, the, and the story that is of importance is these interactions between and amongst um, these characters figuring out what freedom means for them, means, means for each of them. Yeah, wow, yeah, that's a wonderful answer. Um, oh, I have so many questions just from what you said, but um, I was just thinking about like what you said about the Toni Morrison quote and this um, exploration of the freedom of motherhood. What's actually really striking to me about that in the context of this book is that for the motherhood that the that being a daughter, you know, that there's a lot of freedom for um, Liberty's mother mm -hmm. to, to create this country for her, but Liberty feels really constrained by that. She feels like a lack of freedom from that mm -hmm. world. So I was kind of thinking about um, what drew you to exploring that aspect of um, the uh, of Black motherhood or Black daughterhood, maybe. And also, I was curious, um, what felt important to talk about in this time period that what felt important like interesting to talk about um taking that concept but putting it in this time and examining it in this historical context um so to your first question like i i i wanted sort of liberty to really um test the constraints of what is considered freedom and and so she's her mother in in many ways she's an extremely privileged character you know she's living um as a free black girl during the civil war with a mother who's a doctor she can read she lives in this free black settlement she's free of violence she's living an extremely privileged existence and yet was as soon as she walks out of her mother's house she's still a dark-skinned black young girl in Civil War America, which means she's at the absolute bottom of any social rung or room that she walks in, white, black, or mixed. So um, I really wanted to sort of play with that, that she can have all this, her mother can give her all of these freedoms as a mother, but mm. she still lives in the world. She still is gonna like walk out the yeah. door and 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 have these issues and, and um, part of the friction between her and her mother is that when her, her mother is, um, is white passing. So when her mother walks out that door, even though she's also black, she's living a very different experience than Liberty is. And her mother fundamentally can't understand that difference because her mother is a proud black woman. She's not trying to pass as a white person. She knows that she's black. She's, um, you know, very comfortable in, in acknowledging that about herself and uh, and is deeply committed to a version of black liberation. So in her mother's mind, she's sort of like, why is this a big divide between us? And Liberty is is still young, so she's not able to articulate what, what actually that is. Um, and so I, I wanted to sort of explore that tension for that character. And then I really liked the idea of um, for uh, for Liberty or, or for setting it during this time period, um, Reconstruction, I mean, I don't think I'm the first person to say this, but Reconstruction is, is a sort of exact mirror for our time period right now and that it was a, a era of extraordinary black achievement and black excellence. You know, you had people who were um, literally only a couple years out of slavery, founding their own towns, setting up their own newspapers, own hospitals, universities, um, uh, quickly acquiring education and the, and the ability to read um, and um, just really sort of uh, flowering um, and, and, and looking for any place to um, uh, build and, and, and expand, even though they've just lived through an extremely traumatic historical moment as enslaved people and then the civil war on top of it. And then, um, you know, coming out of that, um, it's really astonishing when you look at it. So it's a, a, a period of, of, of black flowering and black excellence, but then it's also a period of intense racialized violence against black people by white people and the complete loss of democracy in this country for almost a hundred years, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it's, it is scarily like our own, our own time period, sadly, right now. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of explore, um, what it would have been like to live in that time period and live a, a, a Liberty lives a pretty, I mean, in many ways she's extraordinary, but her experience is also pretty ordinary, you know, like she's, she's doing sort of standard, 
um, coming of age things like leaving home and going to a different environment, a different school and getting to know different people. And so her life is continuing on with those sort of milestones of, of a regular life in this extraordinary time period. Um, oh, I'll, are there, Nick, I just want to leave a little space for if there's questions, are there any questions? Right now? Okay, great. Um, so you're saying you wanted to, um, what it's, you were trying to evoke what it was like to really live, not, and this is obviously fiction. This is not, an, this is not a nonfiction book. And what was so moving to me was how richly detailed and felt in the body this book was. Um, there's so many details from things like, you know, like the pansies, like the pressed pansies in the brim of someone's hat or the Tom Thumb weddings um, to things like uh, there's a character, Emmanuel, who is very fair skinned, is a black, uh, like a fair skinned black man who has been taught by his enslaved, formerly enslaved mother to hold his lips in a way that makes them look less uh, less plump and to, as a way of passing. And that those little details really evoked a very physically a world um at, that was that was sometimes really like that last detail was really startling to me because it was so embodied this racialized violence it was like a simple thing that he did all the time that it had been the book says beaten into him but mm -hmm. that was just something that he did and that was like part of his daily life so I was really curious if you wanted to talk about, it must be such a fine balance of um, wanting to stay true to the historical facts and also um, giving yourself space to breathe into these characters. And you've done such a beautiful job of bringing these characters into their body, like bringing us into the sensory world of this novel. So I wanted to hear you talk about how you were striking that balance where you let yourself, where it was really important to stay with the facts uh, that you had on hand, where archival silence offer you spaces to enter and where you really let yourself invent. Yeah. Um, so I, I love doing research for this. It was really fun to do um, the archival research. And I, I got to read a bunch of sort of memoirs from people from that time period, which were so interesting because, um, you know, they were talking like, again, like this, this period of, of extraordinary movement. And um, there were sort of these places where they, it sounded very contemporary. Like um, I read this memoir from this woman named Ella Shepard, who was a um, member of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. So she was a, a part of this group of uh, black singing, black singing troupe that would have sung um, spirituals to raise money for um, Fisk University in Tennessee, which is a historically black college, um, which was just founded like right, right after the Civil War. So. Um, she wrote this memoir of traveling around and um, and singing, and they were a, an extremely popular group because if you can imagine um, 1865, 66, if you didn't live beside a plantation, you would never have heard a spiritual before in your life. So when they performed them for in, in cities in the North and, and in cities in Europe, it was a revelation to people. They had never, literally never heard this type of music before. Um, and so they were a sensation. And, but she, she talks, the, the, the point of this is, is that she, she talks in the memoir about how um, she never wanted to sing spirituals for a white audience ever. And, and that the spirituals were um, a, a deeply personal um, thing and that they were the songs that her parents sang in the fields. And so to hear them sung um, was, her parents wouldn't even teach them to her. They would sing them to each other, but she didn't even know them growing up because they didn't want her to have that experience. And so when they were trying to figure out ways to um, raise money for this college and her professor said, you have to sing spirituals, she and her other fellow students said, no, we don't want to because it's this deeply personal thing. And her professors essentially said, get over it. You're being too sensitive. You're being sensitive college students. And um, you know, you know, a generation before you would have been able to do this. How come you guys can't? And I just that sounded so contemporary to me. That's such like a debate that we're currently having on college campuses. Yeah. <laughs> where students say like, should we really be doing it this way? This seems like really traumatic and problematic. And everybody over 40 is like, get over it. We did it too. It's fine. It's, it's such a weird thing. And, and we, we, you know, our stakes are much lower than like, you know, the, the cultural memory of slavery. But um, it, it's just such a funny, those moments in the archives where you are, finding sort of those echoes of our, of our current time and you're seeing things that feel like so contemporary are just a part of human nature, like on a very deep level. Um, that's really fun. And those are usually the pieces of, of um, research that end up in the novel. 
Um, wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I was thinking about also, so at, very big, at the very beginning of the novel, um, there is a character who comes to be known as Ben Daisy, and he's recently been liberated from, slave, from slavery. Um, and we see him really struggling um, to adjust to life after that. And when I was thinking of, when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, this is so interesting because the characters, this was a moment where when you're reading something in our contemporary time, we have an understanding of it that is different than the worldview of the historical and cultural um, moment. And that was a moment where I would look at that character and say, oh, he has complex PTSD. You know, he has like, you know, you know, I could diagnose him with the like pop right. psychology that's in our <laughs> current parlance, you, you know, and Dr. Sampson is treating him and she's treating him as though he has been haunted. And, and so that was really interesting. I was reading that and I hope I'm not giving anything away. It's kind of in the beginning of the novel, but there's a, the, the novel, actually he literally is haunted you mm -hmm. know that there's like we there this uh, there's a moment where the novel sort of takes a side with the cultural the context of the cultural moment that it's it's writing it's um describing and it makes that haunting literal so mm -hmm. i was thinking about one of the like probably one of the delicious uh tensions of writing a historical novel must be being like i'm a current day person writing in this current day time and i have all of my ideas and assumptions and also like giving space and and seeing how those two the worldview of your characters and your own our own worldview kind of mash up against each other so i that was a moment that it really stuck out to me but i was wondering if there are other places where you were really thinking about that or if you wanted to talk about the choice to really literalize um that daisy's experience in that way or anything that that brings up for you yeah bring it's it's a couple things like one of them is um when i was writing this novel i was teaching a, a course i taught it a couple times when i was writing the novel on ghost stories on um, the craft of writing ghost stories. And I was teaching it for um, uh, MFA's fiction students. Um, so it was a graduate level course on like, what, what is a ghost story and how do you construct one? And um, what are the elements of one? And so I was, there's, a, there's an excellent uh, academic book called, um, uh, that's about um, haunting in actually in Toni Morrison's novels and because uh, there's always a ghost in a, Mor in a, in a Morrison novel. Um, and so I, I was thinking a lot about what um, sort of ghosts usually do in a, in a book, which is they're almost always um, a symbol of a past crime, usually historical, that can't be spoken about in the present. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I was sort of like really liked that idea and sort of toying with that that idea, even though Ben Daisy never shuts up about <laughs> the crime that sort of happened to him. <laughs> but um, you know, like in the larger sense of the culture that he's living in, um, they're not able to talk about anything uh, anything that's awful about sort of slavery. All of that is taboo to talk about. Um, and so um, that was part of it. And then the other part is there's a, there's this really sort of wonderful um, Paris Review interview with um, Isaac Bachavez Singer, where he talks about, he has this great thing where he talks about how um, before we knew what electricity was, there must have been a time when people took off um, their like wool clothing at night and they saw little sparks in the air and they wouldn't have had any way to explain what this was because there was no understanding of like static electricity or anything like that. And so everybody must have seen those things, but only a few people in a, in a culture or in a town probably would have acknowledged it and said, what are those things? Mm. And um, some towns probably would have made up a story about what it was. And, but many others may have just said that it's in your mind, forget about it, it's not real. Um, but now we have an explanation of what that is. We say it's static electricity, it's static cling or whatever. When you're, when you're taking off your thing, we have it, we have a actual explanation of what it is. And he talks about what that's part of what an artist does is that they're looking at things in the world that we currently either don't have an explanation for, or, or actively suppress an explanation for, and you attempt to, um, create a story to explain what it is, um, so that you can be talking to people who come after you who may have more information about what it is that you're seeing. And I just love that so much. And it, it really sort of informed how I, how I thought about what I would put in about what we know about how people um, react and interact to um, sort of great traumatic events. And, and like I said, when I would read 
in the archives, these memoirs of people who um, had lived through slavery or were um, you know, one generation removed from slavery, so much of what they're describing is, is trauma responses. And yet, um, you know, they don't have the words <laughs> to explain what that was. There's, there's different things that they do to explain what it was, but that's, that's what it is when you read it, when you know, you, you read about things or when you see, um, you know, like, uh, Sojourner Truth, um, you know, wrote many memoirs in her life, um, but between them, she was oftentimes really struggling with an addiction to alcohol. And when you think about what she probably lived through and why that would have been, it makes perfect sense. But in the parlance of the 19th century, she didn't really have a way to explain what that was besides sin, which she knew what it, that, it, what, that it wasn't. And so much of her life was spent sort of trying to search to, to explain why she was doing that and what she was doing. Um, and, and sort of poignantly not really coming up with an answer because at the time there was no way to explain it in a way that was true to her experience. Um, so I thought about that a lot, especially when I was sort of writing um, the, the book goes, travels to Haiti for the second half and um, voodoo as a tradition is a big part of it. And so I didn't wanna sort of write about voodoo as in a, in a stereotypical way or in a way that sort of made it feel like it was um, uh, you know, uh, sensationalized mm -hmm. and a great way to sort of approach it is less sort of like, this is people, these are people making up magic or people trying to dupe other people or anything like that. If you think about it as it's, it's a, it's explaining something in a society or a culture that I am not a part of that is experiencing things that I could not experience. And this is the way this culture has come up to classify them. Um, and on that level, um, I can find a way in to be able to talk about it. Oh yeah, one of my that maybe that already answers one of my questions. I was I was going to ask you about Haiti and how um, I maybe I just wanted to know. Did you always you were you were talking in the beginning how the real life Liberty did go to Haiti and so that was part of her story. I was wondering if you always knew that the story was going to Haiti and how you wanted to approach. You're already writing about a time period and sort of in some ways like a culture that we're not a part of anymore because it's so far in the past. So with there, if you had a different approach when you were approaching um, writing about America, Reconstruction, uh, Reconstruction era Brooklyn versus Reconstruction era Haiti and what you were thinking about when you were writing those two different sections of the book. Yeah, um, Haiti was a really daunting uh, part to write because like you said, I'm not from that culture. I'm not Haitian, I'm not Haitian American. I don't speak French or Creole. Um, and so, and I, and when I started the novel, I had never been, I went for about five days and, and when I was um, drafting it. Um, and so I was really apprehensive about it for a long time. And then I sort of came to the conclusion that the character of Liberty, who's telling the story, she's an outsider herself. She's not Haitian. And so she's going to get things wrong. And, and her point of view can be one of an outsider looking in, which is the point of view that I have sort of going through it, being removed culturally, mm -hmm. and then also across space and language. Um, and so that sort of opened it in and, and made me feel comfortable as a writer to um, play with those pieces. And then, of course, you know, I tried to read as much as I could about that historical period. But then I also tried to sort of find other ways in like through the land since this is um, uh, a story that's taking place in the 1870s. So sort of like pre mass culture, pre pop culture, pre um, or, or limited print culture, how you would experience a place is less sort of like, can I find the right newspaper or whatever about it, but really sort of, can I figure out, um, you know, what plants grew there, what, what, um, where the sun would have, what, what a sunrise or sunset would look like there. Um, what's it like to swim in the ocean? I remember when I went to, to Haiti, I was so surprised that um, in the, the place where the novel ends up being set, Jacques Mel, um, the beaches there are so beautiful and, but you can't swim in any of them because of the certain current that it is. And, and mm. so you, you, I mean, you, you can, but you drown basically. There's only, there's only like a certain, there's one season where you write, right after, right before carnival when you can swim um, during Lent. It's actually really, uh, or sorry, or, or pre-Lent. It's actually very beautiful um, when you think about it sort of like in the span of time, but um, there's just sort of like this one window where you can sort of swim in the ocean, even those sorts of details. Are so help are so helpful as um, an outsider and and helpful to know across time. So, yeah, it's really beautiful. Those the landscape is rendered so vividly in in 
in Haiti, I can, I, there's still some <laughs> images that I have that are so indelible from that section of the book. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I was reading a short essay that you wrote about a, a text called The Hairdresser's Experience of the High Life, I think is what it was called. And I just would love to hear you talk a little bit about that text and at what point you found that in your research and if that, how that influenced either the direction that the story was taking or the approach or like the tone or anything about how you were deciding to tell the story. Yeah, sure. Um, so I found this uh, another memoir from a, a black woman writer. These are all published in a in a compendium that um, Henry Louis Gates uh, put out about three years ago, called the Penguin's Guide to Nineteenth Century Black Female Writers, Black American Female Writers. Um, but then you can also get um, full text versions too. Usually now they're all digitized on the internet. But um, this particular memoir, it's from this woman who. Um, she was a uh, she was a free born free and she lived in Buffalo, New York. She got married. Um, she decided marriage wasn't for her. Apparently, had kids, and then one day just decided like I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of here. I, I want to see the world, and she left. And she was trained as a hairdresser. So she first she went to Canada, um, and then she came back and traveled throughout the U.S. in the North and South and Midwest. Um, working as a hairdresser mostly for wealthy um, white people also in Europe. And she wrote this incredibly gossipy memoir about traveling around. Um, and it's all sort of about like who had uh, fake hair, who had fake teeth, who knew how to sort of set the candles right at dinner so that they looked really good, um, who was really only about trying to marry their daughters off to the richest person versus trying to make a love marriage for their, she's, it's just, it's all gossip. It's all um, just sort of 19th century gossip but she was traveling pre-Civil War and she's a black woman. And so throughout it, she'll just have these sudden asides where she'll she'll make it very clear that she that's her position that she was traveling through this world. Like there's a part where um, she's on a steamboat in um, somewhere in the Midwest, I can't remember. Um, and she realizes that there is a, a person on there who is um, escaping from slavery, who's, who's sort of stowed away and is, is escaping from slavery. And um, she realizes that the other people on the boat are gonna turn that person in. And she stands between them and she stops it. And then she's actually is almost lynched herself and put into prison and she only gets out because these two um, white male abolitionists on board help her and then they actually get killed. And all of this is just in, it's a chapter in the book in between, I was at this ball and I was doing this woman's hair and um, then I was in Paris and I was doing whatever. And it was just so interesting to see um, a life sort of live that way and how those two um, existences were, were occurring, of course, side by side. But I think oftentimes when we read historical fiction, especially, we assume that those two worlds were so separated from each other and they really weren't, you know, they were, they were, that's the tragedy of it. Those two worlds were the same worlds. Mm -hmm. um, you can't separate those two. Uh, and her memoir is just really frank about that, but it's also just very fun to read because she's also very frank about um, how desperately she wanted to travel and see the world just for herself. Um, you know, she, she left her husband. She didn't really care. There's no real reason for it. There's no noble reason for it. It's just because she wanted to. And that is so rare to, to read, I think, across races for sort of any woman, black, white, uh, brown, whatever, writing. I think that's an extremely sort of rare position to read in a memoir. Um, and for the, that reason, I read her and, and it was a really great way to gain a sense of freedom about writing about liberty and letting her be a little frivolous. You know, it's really interesting to see people's reaction to the book because a lot of people like the character a lot, but there are some people who say, I like the book, I like the writing, but I didn't like liberty. And I think it's because she's, she, nothing bad happens to her. She's not a particularly ennobled character. She's mm. kind of dealing with very um, mundane uh, issues, even though she's sort of against this big epic, um, thing and she's surrounded by extraordinary people but she herself uh, by design is not an extraordinary character she's very ordinary she doesn't really have larger ambitions and when she does something it's it's solely for herself it's not because she's sacrificing for somebody else or anything like that and so um, reading that memoir really helped me feel okay with having a character um, do that in, in a historical novel like this. 
That's right. She's sort of like, I mean, she's a historical figure, right? And she's living in an extremely historical time and is surrounded by all these historical, incredible tra trailblazing people. But there's something almost like, there's, there's, there's something very bold that about being like people are people <laughs> you know like you don't have to be like an incredible figurehead in order to have a book about you you can just be alive and and have complicated feelings um yeah. as you were talking I was thinking about pleasure and joy and tenderness and and even frivolity there's maybe even a little frivolity in the book in mm -hmm. a in a wonderful way with, with a tom thumb wedding mm -hmm. um and I was thinking of I was putting that up against um the lack of on-page violence, we see a lot of the effects of violence and sometimes like the, the um, they're, and very hauntingly, but we never, we, I don't think we ever see violence happen on the page. Um, so I wondered if both of those, I'm sh I know that both of those choices were intentional, the, the choice to show liberty is an ordinary, in some ways, in the best way, like an ordinary, a real person who experiences like, you know, pleasure, pleasure and um who you know that we also get windows into other people's pleasure and all a, a whole range of feelings and ordinary feelings and also that violence being off the page so i maybe you feel like you've already answered that but if you have anything more to say about those two choices next to each other yeah no i um i wanted intentionally wanted to keep the violence off the page in part because i was aware of how many civil war novels novels set during the civil war and reconstruction are um are centered on violence. I mean, how could they not be as incredibly violent time? Um, and so part of me really just wanted the artistic challenge of trying to evoke that time without that. Um, and then also I really wanted to be intentional about knowing that this was a novel about uh, black characters, that there are no main white characters in the novel. Um, I didn't want a writer, a reader to only sort of open this novel and see just people being brutalized sort of over and over again. You know, there's a big debate going on right now around, um, uh, particularly in in depictions of uh, slavery, sort of like how often are those depictions uh, in in art, particularly probably if people are talking about movies and TV, how often are those de depictions for a um, black audience and how often are those depictions just about sort of getting to see people beat up and sort of like um, satisfying sort of a, a darker or more um, violent impulse. And so, um, you know, I'm always taken so much, there's like a, there's like a, I think some people, I think black artists a little bit younger than me often say like, I, I would never write about slavery or I don't ever want to read another slave book, slave book about slavery again, or I never want to see another movie about slavery again. And I get that, but like the historian in me says that's just completely wrong. Like we, we, we've, we, the slavery in this country went on for hundreds of years and we know probably like one one thousandth of <laughs> of it you know um and even that seems like it's too much and, and it also just sort of as an artist like to say there's a certain time period that I will never touch just feels like really wrong to me mm -hmm. and so I wanted to sort of figure out a way to write about this time period write about the subject um that isn't just further brutalization um and sort of falling into old tropes and gets you a feel of that time period but the artistic challenge was to do it without um relying on sort of that crutch of of in incredible violence um and I get it you know like I what I very rarely or I I very selectively um take in media about um enslavement or slavery it really takes a lot for me to um check out a project like that like I have to know and trust the person mm -hmm. who's making it and um and and know to what ends people are doing are deciding to depict that stuff on screen. But I also think it's it's incredibly short-sighted to just sort of be like, we should never talk about this ever because it's um, uncomfortable or, or upsetting or, or makes me sad. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I was wondering, I, I wanted to ask you about the idea of home that really seems central to this novel. And the way that you explore that is so beautiful because um, all of these characters are grappling with, in a political way, what does home mean? Is home Haiti? Like, can we make a home in America? Can Black people make a home in America? Can Black people make a home in Haiti? Is that where we're going to be free? And um, so the characters are having these intense and really devastating political conversations um, about home. At the same time, this is a coming-of-age novel, and 
a coming of age novel is about home often, mm -hmm. you know, the character is leaving home and Liberty herself is like, where's home? Is home Brooklyn? Is home my mother's house? Is home my mother's garden? Is home Haiti? Is home my husband? Mm -hmm. um, so she's also grappling with these, like these bigger questions and these um, very personal questions at the same time. So I wondered if you just want to speak about that. That it, to me is the question at the center of the novel. And I wanted to, to know why you were called to looking at that question with this story and anything you want to say about the notion of home in this novel. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's so, um, it's such an interesting sort of question. And I think particularly for Black Americans, like historically, that question of home is so loaded and um, there's so many sort of assumptions of where you should and shouldn't feel at home. Um, it's so funny, I was doing an interview with um, Andrea Lee earlier today who has a novel out right now called Red Island House that is really fantastic. It's about a, a black American woman um, traveling through Madagascar over like the course of 20 years, it's great. Um, and so we, but we, I bring it up because we were sort of talking about like this question of the Black diaspora, particularly for Black Americans, like this assumption that you're going to sort of find home wherever other Black people happen to be. And then the um, sort of reality of that, which is oftentimes not the case. And the sort of longing to assume that the places where your ancestors were really sort of brutally ripped from, you can somehow return to and feel a connection to. And I, I know people who do and who have, but then there's also sort of like, I know many more people who have tried to make that journey back and, and can appreciate it and understand where that came from, but there's still that loss there. There's still that um, never returning home part of it. Um, and so I just found those sort of um, that, that discord a really sort of rich place to explore in the fiction. Um, that, thank you. Um, I, we have like, do we have any more time? Yeah, I have yeah. like truly 17 more questions for you <laughs> probably. <laughs> but um, do we have a time for one more question? Yes, please. Okay. And there's, uh, Carol actually uh, had some things she wanted to contribute to y'all's conversations. I'm just gonna read her responses really quick because they're so thoughtful um, about clearly from how much she loves your novel. Caitlin and Shruti, your great, great questions um, are sparking this. So I didn't wanna leave her out. Um, so Carol says, motherhood and being a daughter can also be enslaving because of all the responsibility. I think Liberty felt those reins because she rebelled against learning to become a doctor at college and did not tell her mother about that. Um, then she says, Liberty is much is as much of a privileged outsider in Haiti as her mother is a privileged woman in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And her last uh, comment, which I thought is so lovely that you're so involved, Carol, thank you. Slavery and repression of minorities is still going on, unfortunately. However, Liberty takes it upon herself to rebel against her mother and society despite it all. She makes herself her own victim if you wanna see it like that. She has accomplished nothing. Perhaps she'll succeed as a mother when she gives birth to her twins. Okay, I'm not going to go any further because they're a little plot for the spoilers, but but, uh, but Carol, thank you so much for being so connected to the book and the conversation. Um, if any of you haven't read this incredible book yet, grab it from your library bookstore wherever you find your books uh, because it is a treasure and as brilliant as the conversation you've been hearing. Shruti, yes, please do um, pick a question that you would like to wrap up with. And I know we all have tons more, but I'm gonna trust you to pick the one that you feel would be good to. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. For writing the book. We'll have, oh, thank more, you. We'll have one more question because uh, we do have a few more minutes and, and it's such a delicious book to talk about. So Shruti, and then thank you, Joan. I'll hand it over to John and let him close. Um, okay, great. One more question. So I read in an interview that you read the book Bridge of Beyond. You said you read that book twice while you were writing the book. And I was just wondering if there were, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that book or other books that you were in, you felt like this book was in conversation with. I'm sure you read like truly literally hundreds of books in order to write this book because it seems so deeply research, but um, if you had a few books that you felt like you were, this book was speaking with in conversation with, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, um, uh, The Bridge of Beyond is this beautiful novel by Simone Schwarzbart um, about Guadalupe and it's a novel, it's about women directly after um, so on the island. Um, it's a mother, a daughter and a grandmother 
Um, it's really beautifully written, and it's a it's also um, an experimental novel. So it's just it breaks all these forms, and um, the translation. There's a new translation out from New York and New York Review of Books Classics that's really lovely. Um, and uh, I just, I really liked that book as a as a way to sort of play with for, form and to um, bring things apart. And then um, this book, when I was knew that I wanted to write about this story, I was sort of trying to find uh, similar stories that I could sort of um, uh, steal plot structure from so that I would have space to do the research for it. And um, I sort of, latched on to the uh, Persephone myth because it felt very similar. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a mother mm -hmm. leaving a daughter, a daughter sort of having to choose between her lover and her mother. Um, and so I read as many different versions of that as I could. So um, Rachel Zucker is a poet and she has a, a poetry collection um, that is written as a series of letters between um, Persephone and her mother, but it's set in the present day. It's really beautiful. Um, so I read that a lot and I, I love that idea of letters. Um, you know, letters were an original part of the story that I heard from um, uh, the descendant, but then also sort of reading the poetry really helped me sort of feel comfortable using that form in part in the, in the book. Well, wonderful. Thank right. you so that much, Caitlin. Was, was <laughs> on. Um, thank you both so much for that glorious discussion. Uh, John Sexton is going to close the evening, and I want to thank y'all for letting Book Yaya and Chappaqua Library be part of this. John? And thank you, Dylan, for uh, providing me with the most uh, brilliant hour I've had today. So. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin, I can't believe you. This is your second interview like this. Uh, mm -hmm. But thank you for your insights into a stunning novel, and Trudy for your really insightful questions. Uh, I, I appreciate it, and thank you for enriching our lives with both of your talents. And oh, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for having me. For Trudy's new novel that's coming out this fall, The Archer, from also from Malcolm I just want to add another thing. John, are you finished? Yes. Uh, well, I just want to add one more statement. Um, author talks are very important, but I have got to tell you, this was one of the most interesting conversations between the two of you, Caitlin and Shruti, that I, I've listened to in a while. You, you, of course, your, your questions were wonderful, Shruti, but hearing Caitlin's conversation and the way she researched and and, and the other authors that she relied on. It's just, it, this is what a, a, an author talk should be. Mm -hmm. And I really want to congratulate both of you. And of course, always congratulate um, Delaunay. But this was just a pleasure to listen to. And I thank you both. I completely agree. It was at such a high level and all due to you incredible women. So you've given us such a beautiful gift tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very thank much. you all. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>